haven't been to Pensacola since about 1994, and I'm happy to come back. I came back last night, and Sharon was kind enough um, to take me out to the fish house where I had uh, grits and yaya, and I thought it was fantastic. So I'm, I'm happy to be down here uh, in Pensacola again. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. I saw some just amazing things going on here today uh, in support of so many different efforts um, for the government and, and, and other efforts. Um, but uh, for those of you who perhaps just come for the lectures and, and don't know a lot about IHMC, I would encourage you to come get a tour if you can or, or whatever, whatever process they have because it's, it's just amazing the work that they're doing here. And uh, I'm very happy to be down here. Um, so I woke up this morning and uh, I get little Google alerts on my computer and in my email was uh, an op-ed in your local newspaper this morning. Um, just so we know the speed of information in the world today, that went to about 50,000 people, friends of mine. Uh, in about 23 seconds I got more phone calls about being down here in Pensacola and speaking here this evening than uh, it, it, so good on you. Is, Mr. is it Mr. Wernicke? Is he in the room today? All right. Carl, zero. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> so tonight, um, I, it's very interesting. I, I, I no longer work at Blackwater. I haven't since May. Uh, when I was accepted to go to school at Harvard, I resigned. Um, so many people always want to ask lots of questions, particularly about Blackwater, particularly about um, perhaps different incidents and things of that nature. Um, and I'm happy to answer some of those questions at the end of the presentation as I can, but keep in mind I can't answer everything. I don't know the answer to everything, but I'll do the best I can. But for this evening, what I want to talk about is, is the broader contribution that the private sector makes um, to national and international security. And hopefully what I'm going to do is perhaps give you a different perspective than that, than that of which you might be reading in the media, um, seeing different movies, documentaries, or perhaps if you do, like Carl said, Google Chris Taylor and Blackwater and you might read a bunch of things that may not be completely accurate. So I hope, to, I hope, I hope that we kind of sift through some of that tonight. So I, generally when I, when I do talks like this, it's a very international presentation. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Americanize it a lot this evening um, because if we were going to talk about the history of mercenaries, we would start back with Xerxes and Ramses um, in the BC era and just and move our way through history. And I'm, I'm not sure anybody wants a, a history lesson this evening. But I am going to give you a little bit, hopefully, uh, American history lesson um, and just talk about the contribution uh, from the American perspective of the private sector. But how did we get to where we are currently today? Uh, it's, no, it's no secret that you can open up a newspaper, uh, read a blog, and you're going to read about a private contractor somewhere, Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, uh, and any number of other places. Well, here's, here's, here's a couple facts that we need to know. Um, over the last 20-some years, we've had a global drawdown of about 6 million soldiers, from, militaries from all over the world. These are people who have been professionally trained, um, who serve their countries, and who are out of work. Um, and so uh, they're looking for things to do. And uh, entrepreneurial and innovative people started to form uh, companies to help support different efforts, not all of them good efforts. Um, and of course, we always hear about the, revolutionary, uh, the revolution in military affairs. This is sort of an iterative process. It didn't start with Secretary Rumsfeld, although Secretary Rumsfeld was pushing hard for it. Um, it's been going on since 1775. Every time we find a different way to fight a war, we call it a revolution in military affairs um, with, with the requisite changes in force structure, weaponry, and there you have it. And then September 11th happened. Um, and as I was reminded today by uh, uh, one of the wonderful scientists here at IHMC, um, our cognitive understanding um, uh, our conceptual understanding of the word terrorism for Americans changed on September 11th. The definition you had September 10th is different from the definition that you understand it to be today. And I think that's very, very, very important when we start to talk about the meta questions um, about what should America's role be in the world, what are our national values, and how do we take those and formulate good national security and foreign policy? And, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, going forward. And then, of course, we just have a different 
um, a set of circumstances, a different way of waging war today. Uh, third generation warfare, which is brigades uh, rushing to, moving to maneuver, fire and maneuvering to the target, um, uh, uh, they work. I mean, that works. Um, it's, it's everything that happens afterwards and in between that matters. What's referred to fourth generation warfare, um, where your enemy uses the internet better than you do, where they learn faster than you can adapt, where they spend money in, in places that you didn't think of first. And it's those sorts of things that creates the gaps that sometimes the private sector is perfectly positioned to fill. Okay, I, I imagine that there's going to be some questions uh, later on. So if you don't mind, sometimes I'm going to go through some slides that I don't think are uh, absolutely necessary and we'll drive on so that I can leave enough time for questions. Um, it's interesting, I went to school, as Sharon mentioned, I should mention Sharon was my classmate at Harvard in 2005 at the uh, Program for Senior Executives in National and International Security. That's where we met. So she's a, a well-trained national security expert as well here at IHMC. Um, one of my professors at Harvard the other day said, you need to remember that big business was in the United States before big government was. Why? Because when we settled, these were chartered companies that came over. We had to raise our own private security armies. We had to, we had to provide for ourselves all across um, these first settlements and, and as the colonies were created. And I, I don't mean to say that that's, it should always be that way. I'm saying that that's how it started. Um, contractors, the Plymouth Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company, the Virginia Company, all of these were chartered companies by uh, the British Crown to get things started here in the, in the United States, and uniquely it's the uh, 400th anniversary of the, of, of, of the uh, settling uh, in uh, Jamestown this year. They put on a great celebration. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, this is a Civil War uh, uh, um, example here where, where President uh, Lincoln used uh, Alan Pinkerton as basically his intelligence service. We didn't have a strong intelligence service when the Union was fighting the South. Um, and, and so he went out to private citizens. Um, and if we back up just a second, uh, anybody here been to the White House, seen the White House, been, been up to Washington, seen the White House? Okay, you've looked across the street into Lafayette Park. Um, loosely termed, Lafayette was a contractor. As a matter of fact, we jokingly refer to Lafayette Park as Contractor Park. Um, because the four statues in Lafayette Park are Lafayette, Kosciusko, uh, Rochambeau, and Van Steuben. Thank you um, for the pronunciation. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and so if you think, I think at the time, and, and historians could correct me, before, before uh, Van Steuben and Lafayette retrained or trained the Continental Army, we were about 0-6. Um, and we needed to be a little bit better than that. And with the addition of Rochambeau, uh, uh, his advising uh, Washington, um, and instead of going to Richmond, we went down to Yorktown to fight the battle, which was decisive. Uh, we fared very well. John Paul Jones, who is said to be buried um, underneath the chapel at the Naval Academy. I'm sure that there are Naval Academy graduates in the classroom. It's said that he's buried there. He was a privateer. He, was a, it, it, he wasn't commissioned. Um, afterwards, people were commissioned, but while the Revolutionary War was going on, we had a bunch of private people fighting for us. And it's just interesting to note that, that that's how we started. Um, sutlers and merchants, I'm sure people have heard, have any, has anybody here ever heard of um, Halliburton, KBR? Uh, no? If, if there's anybody who hasn't heard of them. <laughs> okay, they managed the log cap program, which is the logistics uh, assistance program. Uh, or have, and it's changed now. Uh, it was broken up in four, uh, three or four different pieces, and it's been rebid on and on. But at the time, they did. But the same thing actually happened during the Civil War. We had people um, who would follow uh, with the civilian log trains the soldiers and sell them different, different supplies. Has anybody here uh, been to, uh, served, and has been in Korea um, and trained in Korea anywhere? Um, and so... Uh, when they would come around with moon pies and cokes, that was kind of like a Korean log train to service people who were out in the field. It's sort of the same thing that happened uh, um, in, in Virginia, uh, during the Civil War. It happened a lot. I mean, it, it just it keeps going. And it's very interesting. Um, as a matter of fact, Baron uh, Peter von Wegesek won the Congressional Medal of Honor while serving the Union um, in uh, Gainesville. And then, of course, we've heard of the Flying Tigers before. Actually, kind of a super secret, double secret probation program um, that happened between 
FDR and uh, and the UK and, and Winston Churchill, but it also went to China and, and it was kind of backdoored and we had all kinds of stuff going on. But basically, we we released 100 planes uh, to go over. We recruited active duty pilots and other pilots to serve as pilots. We paid them a lot more money. We, we sort of incentivized it. There was an incentive program. The more you uh, do better, the, the more you kill, the more bridges you take out, the more trucks you take out, the more aircraft you shoot down, the more I'm going to pay you. And they were overwhelmingly successful um, during World War II. The, the, the Flying Tigers were fantastic. Of course, they turned into, when I was a young Marine, uh, we used to fly to Okinawa on Flying Tigers. I don't know if they just changed because it was a 747 or, or, or what was going on, but, but the mission still held. So that leads us sort of to today. What do the companies who are participating today actually do? Uh, 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 many of you uh, pick up a paper and you read about companies such as Blackwater, a Triple Canopy, a Dyncor, uh, a SOC SMG. You really what you read is the private security companies, which are probably about 5% of the entire market, maybe, maybe 5%. The rest of the companies do logistic support, medical support, um, waste disposal, very important in Iraq, I have to tell you. Um, transportation support, both aviation and ground. Uh, maintenance support, whether it be on trucks, on vehicle, other vehicles, tanks, uh, um, any other sorts of gear. Th these companies are doing that sort of support. And then at home, we do a lot of planning and games and simulation. Uh, generally, that's conducted in the Beltway or in Virginia. And, and there's other places all around that do that. But, but there's sorts of places like that that that, that, help, that help the government test itself and then help it find solutions for, for moving forward. We also have uh, information and intelligence uh, open source gathering and analysis. And that's something very new. I'm sure if you've read the paper any time recently, there's a big deal. The uh, Central Intelligence Agency came out with um, a report on sort of how many contractors they had and that they were going to reduce the number of contractors they were using by 10%. Um, and, and so on. So, so the whole issue of, of, of the private sector being involved in this is, is as you all know, very contentious. Um, and then the last part is, it's the private security companies who protect people, places, and things. Um, and that's really where my experience has been. You hear a lot of things. I can, uh, you, can, you can pick up a paper or read a blog and read all kinds of stuff that I gotta tell you is just not true, at least it hasn't been true in my experience. So I just wanna go through some of those. Um, private military companies and all of the companies that flow under them are immune from the law. It, it's just not true. They are subject to every bit the law that everyone else is. It's never been an issue of a lack of regulation. It's been an issue of a lack of investigation and enforcement mechanisms that has created this accountability gap. Um, uh, you've heard often that Paul Bremer, Ambassador Paul Bremer signed an order the day before he left that gave immunity to all the contractors. Well, that's not exactly true. What the CPA Order 17 said was, um, you are immune from the Iraqi legal process with regard to the terms and conditions of your contracts. So if I pick up a U.S. contract, rape, murder, manslaughter, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, all that stuff is not contained in any of those terms and conditions and could technically have been tried under Iraqi law. The problem is the Iraqi judiciary is still developing. We don't have a SOFA, a status of forces agreement in place. So um, it, it, I can tell you that nobody was too excited about trying Americans in a developing Iraqi judicial system. Um, I hope that it continues to develop. I hope that it, it, it gets to be the finest judicial system outside the United States, but it's, it's just not there right now. So technically, you could have been charged. More importantly, what you could have been charged uh, under were any, a number of other regulations, and we'll talk about those in a, in a second. Um, private military companies suck a bunch of talent out of the, out of the military. There's a 2005 Government Accountability Office report that said there's no empirical evidence to support that. As a matter of fact, People joined and leave the military for any number of reasons. Um, if some of them choose to get out and they re-leverage the, the talents that they have, the skills that they have with a private military company, that's one thing. But let's remember, pilots have been doing that for decades and decades. They leave after uh, their service and they fly for 
any number of, of airlines. I can point you to any number of the multinational corporations, maybe a General Electric, who have junior officer transition training programs, um, who are also interested in the fine young officers and senior enlisted people in our military um, when they decide to leave service to come to work for them. Um, so it's not just these private military companies. There are 25,000 private security contractors in Iraq. Roughly, that's correct. Only about 2,000 are American. Um, the overwhelming majority are Iraqis themselves providing security for their own country. Uh, the next biggest number are what we call TCNs, third country nationals from different countries. Um, and I should point out that the use of third country nationals, at least for those companies that work on US government contracts, is mandated by the contract. It is not true that um, a company, a security company working on a, a government contract, or not just a security company, a private military company working on a contract can elect to replace a certain uh, 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 American person with a TCN because they may be cheaper. That's not the way it works. There are specific requirements and mandates in these requests for proposals that dictate this is okay to have third country nationals working for it, and this is not. So third country nationals aren't doing it. They're not protecting the ambassador. They're, they're generally standing static posts inside a, safe, a safer um, area, and they check IDs, and they just ensure that people aren't getting through a gate that aren't supposed to. But they're not doing, um, they do a lot of lifting, but they're not doing the heavy lifting that, that our brave men and women who are, who are uh, protecting congressmen and diplomats and the ambassador and everyone else are doing. Um, mercenaries, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the um, uh, additional protocol one of 1977 uh, to the Geneva Conventions, there's a definition of mercenary. And actually, uh, private security companies, private military companies don't fit that definition very well. Uh, I don't have it up here because people tell me it gets, they're bored when they have to read the definition, so I took it out of the presentation. But basically what it describes, and this will stir up a little bit of trouble, but that's okay. If you read the definition, it more aptly describes some UN peacekeepers more so than it describes private military companies. And we'll talk about why, that, why that's so uh, when we talk about peacekeeping uh, in the future. PMCs gouge the government. Well, I, I'm sure that there's bad actors out there. As a matter of fact, I know that there's bad actors out there. Um, but I also know that for the Defense Department, the Defense Contract Management Agency, the Defense Contract Audit Agency, the SIGUR office um, now, and, and the associated offices in the other federal agencies have very sharp pencils. What they don't have is enough people. What they don't have is deployable assets. If you're going to issue a contract in theater, in country, then you have to have proper management and oversight in country, in theater, to ensure that the service or the goods that you are buying, you're getting. And, and we lack that. And there's something called the uh, Gansler, Com uh, uh, Gansler Commission that just came out. It was a report on army contracting in which uh, um, General Gansler, uh, former General Gansler had said, uh, you know, we, we need to square this away. We don't, we don't have... Uh, the proper oversight and management tools in place to continue to use these contract platforms to our benefit. And so, um, yes, there are people out there, who, there are vendors out there who take advantage of the system and we should catch them and their punishment should be, after due process, should be whatever it is, whatever it's supposed to be. But we just don't have that process in place right now. It needs to grow if we're gonna continue using the private sector um, in, in, in such a, uh, a big way as we are now. And PMCs can hire anybody. Well, sure they can. They can hire anybody they want. And I will tell you, back in 2003, 2004, uh, in Baghdad and the rest of Iraq, yeehaw, it was Cowboy City. There were people all over the place. If you had a resume and a laptop, you could form a company in the trunk of your car, and you could apply uh, for a contract and be granted something. Because the overwhelming amount of work that was coming out of the Coalition Provisional Authority um, was insane. You could go to the CPA website and there were thousands of contracts being let for security services, for other types of services. We didn't have the right infrastructure in place to manage all that. And then what happened was we let some cowboys in, some bad people in, they stirred up a bunch of trouble. It was applied to everyone. Um, and, and so now we had the beginnings of this sort of uh, reputational challenge uh, that you read about today. 
But let me tell you what has to happen for, for those companies that work on U.S. government contracts. Um, one, all of them are pretty much former military, former law enforcement folks. Um, their records are screened. DD-214s, for, for those of you who are formerly in the military, your record of service. Honorable discharges. Um, they have NCIC checks. Uh, um, uh, physical fitness tests. Um, for those contracts that require security clearances, and I'll use my former company, Blackwater, as an example, um, in order to work on that uh, worldwide personal protective services contract for the State Department, you have to have a secret or top secret clearance. That's not performed by Blackwater, that's performed by the government. Um, so you have all of these wickets that you have to go through, uh, which also include psychological tests by clinical psychologists, and, and you have all these wickets to go through before you can even deploy somebody somewhere. So there are substantial substantial front end um, checks in place. Now that doesn't mean that you can't, that you don't continue to watch folks um, when you have them deployed because what, what they look like in a, in a benign environment is probably, uh, it could change if they're in a dynamic environment. And uh, so you're always got uh, peer evals and leadership evals while they're, while they're deployed. And so that's, that's what happens. And I just want, I brought all these things up because I can pick up a paper any time and read none of this. I don't ever see how, you never read about how people are vetted. You don't read about how they're trained. You don't read any of the stuff that actually happens. Um, you just read the big sexy story. And I like big sexy stories too, um, but I like sometimes truthful big sexy stories. And so here I am. So what really is the debate? I mean, are we privatizing? Are we outsourcing? Are we insourcing? Are we integrating expertise? What, what is the government doing? And who's telling them to do it? Right? I mean, what, what are we actually doing? Outs for me, outsourcing and privatization are terms of emotion because they do not accurately describe exactly what's going on. I will use my company, my former company again. Um, the, training is, the training standard is set by the government. Where they move to and who they take somewhere is set by the government. Their chain of command runs up through the government, ultimately to the ambassador. Um, it is unfair and inaccurate to say that there isn't a chain of command. It just doesn't happen to be a military chain of command. But you know what? If I go to any country in the world where there's a U.S. ambassador, guess who's the senior person in the room? The U.S. ambassador, right? So I, I, I think it's not fair to say that there's no chain of command for these men and women when they're working, when in fact their movements and their training uh, and, and, and their hours are dictated by the government. Uh, it's just not fair. Um, so are we insourcing? Are we, I, that's why I'm a fan of integrating expertise. Um, I, I just don't think, I think it more accurately describes what's going on. The government still has control, um, operational control. The government still knows what's going on. The government still dictates the movements. The government still dictates the work. So for me, it's integrating expertise. It's not like the government said, uh, Company A, please go out and provide security for these people. Do it in any way you like. Do it the best way you like. Here's some money. Thank you very much. Okay, that would be privatizing it, where the company had complete control over how it ran its operations. That's just not, that's just not what happens today. And then, of course, we get to the bigger questions, and there's some other ones later on as well, but what is the role of government in America? Is it to manage process, or is it um, public process, or is it to manage public value? And it's a tough question, and you're going to get, I, I, would, I would imagine that each one of you would give a different answer, but it's certainly a public policy question that we all uh, struggle with and, and, work, and work toward. Um, there is no blanket answer. Sometimes we want to manage uh, process, particularly where it concerns national security, and sometimes we want to manage value, particularly when it concerns um, prosperity, pro uh, economic prosperity. But somehow, somehow we have to find a way to manage the total capacity that we have available to us, which includes the private sector, if the United States has a foreign policy that says um, that's more interventionist than not. And of course we can argue that whether or not we should be an intervention, interventionist country or not. It's, it, it, again, another political discussion. What should we be doing in the world? What is America's role? And how should we, we be doing it? Okay. Um, who, who are these people actually accountable to? What, what actually... Is it just the shareholders? Is it just, uh, is it to the country? Well, I will tell you from my personal perspective, and I understand that I am a sample set of one and do not represent 
uh, everyone else. I served almost 14 years in the Marine Corps. Everything that I did while I was working at Blackwater, I believed that I was supporting my company, I mean my country, and uh, I believed that I was supporting um, the national interest every single time. I, I've never had a discussion otherwise, to tell you the truth. Um, and I've been ridiculed, funnily enough, uh, because of it. Um, we talked about chain of command. I, I, I'd like to pose a question to you. Show of hands, please. How many of you think what's going on today in Iraq and Afghanistan is a military mission? A military mission. Okay. How many of you think what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan today is a diplomatic mission? How many of you think what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan today is a development mission? You've made my point, right, or all of the above. Never in our history have we conducted three parallel missions at the same time like this. And um, I, I think that it's become a, a little complex for us to manage. Um, you, can, you can agree or disagree, or you, can, or you can say I'm not going far enough, but I'm, you know, I know that this is being recorded, so I don't want to get stomped on too poorly. But I, I mean, we're doing, we're doing three different things at one time. Uh, and, it's, and it's really been, it's very been interesting to listen to the commentary. Um, I'm sure you're aware of, the, of the, uh, um, the coverage of the State Department employees, senior employees who were upset about going to Baghdad. And they said in any other situation, we would have, we would have closed that embassy. So what are we doing? Um, and it is. We've made a very complex situation. Um, I think General Petraeus uh, and, and Ambassador Crocker are doing the best that they can with the guidance that they have, and they have made strides. Those two men um, have done a fantastic job with just a, a bunch of twos in their hand. On it's, it's rough. They're having a tough day, but they're doing a fantastic job. And I would like to go back to the military again and say this is not a military issue, a fail, uh, military failure by uh, and not even a those young men and women have done everything we've asked them to do and more, and they continue to do it. And we need to find a better way to be to to to, to engage them and take care of them and and ensure that what we've asked them to do has a clear goal, has a clear clear objectives that they can accomplish it and they can and they and they, and they can move on to something else. Um, it's not them. It is not them. Um, more competition is good. I, I, everybody's heard about sole source contracts, no bid contracts. Yes, that is a vehicle that is used by the U.S. government sometimes. I cannot stand here and tell you how much has been issued in no bid contracts or sole source contracts. I don't know. Um, I, I do know that my personal opinion is this. If I have a toolbox, but I have a bad um, tool user, and he swings the hammer poorly, I don't want to throw the hammer away I want to get a better hammer swinger, right? So that's my opinion. I don't think we should be throwing tools away. And I'm referring to the private sector. We just have to find somebody who knows how, how to control and wield it a lot better than we have going on today. Um, and the way to do that, the way for the government to ensure it's getting the best buck or the best bang for its buck is open and, and fair competition and they should do it every time. Every time that they can do it, they should continue to do it. And, and, and for the most part, we do do that. But there are times when the government has elected to award um, sole source contracts. And I, I don't work for them, so I, don't, I, can't, I can't speak to uh, why that is. But, but, but they, it is a vehicle that can and should be used as a tool when necessary. We shouldn't just take it away. We should understand, but we should, be able, but we should also be able to articulate to you, the taxpayers, to everyone else, why we use this specific vehicle. Um, all right, we talked about all this. These are some of the regulations I'm not certainly not going to go through, but when we talk about what, what are people actually accountable to, these are some of the things. Um, pay particular attention to the Defense Trade Controls Act. Um, there's an office at the State Department called Defense Trade Controls that monitors what's called defense articles and services. That's governed by something called the International Traffic Inter Trafficking and Arms Regulations. Um, it's a big list of stuff that you cannot give to other people, sell to other people, talk, to, uh, talk about to other people, all kinds of things. In order to do it, you have to have a license from the Department of State. In order for any private military company to perform training for a non-U.S. citizen, even if it's one, you have to have a technical assistance agreement. And that technical assistance agreement is granted by the U.S. Department of State. Um, uh, and it's normally that application for a technical assistance agreement is shipped out or farm, farmed out to whatever relevant office, whether it's at the Department of State or the Department of Defense. It's shipped out there, uh, and they yay or nay it. 
that input is taken into account at defense trade controls, and it's either approved or not. If it's disapproved, you can't provide that training. Just can't do it. Um, it's, a, it's a stringent process. And uh, when you talk about that, the, the stringency of that process versus our need to help build partner nation capacity so we don't have to expend all of our resources, all of our national resources to do different things in the world, um, it sounds like it makes sense, but the process is, is very difficult. Um, but I know there's a lot of smart people in Washington working on it or trying to. Um, the anti-torture statute, the War Crimes Act of 1996, all of these acts Contractors fall under. You, you don't escape it because you have a, a contract with the government. Um, again, I go back to its investigation and enforcement. I'm part of a small group um, that's running a, 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 a workshop out of Princeton, um, which is actually meeting this week, and, I, and unfortunately I can't be there, um, that talks about what should the government do. And one of the things we came up with was this. The Department of, right now, if I was a contractor and I allegedly did something wrong, criminally did something wrong, excuse me, um, I should be, the case should make its way to a U.S. attorney in the United States, either where I live, where the, uh, however that's decided. I don't know. The lawyers in the office or in the room could, could explain that. What we want to do, what we think is probably a smarter idea, is to have the Department of Justice, which already has what's called a MEJA office, a Military Extraterritorial -ter Jurisdiction Act office, is to have a deployable package for contingency operations so that it includes evidence collection, um, interviewing capabilities, uh, it can develop a package and then they can turn that package over to the Department of Justice for decision whether or not to prosecute or not. Um, and, and that's what we're hoping to do. I, I think, and, and this group is made up of people from uh, Congress, uh, academics, um, legal scholars, and, and we sort of came to a consensus that said if the, if the Department of Justice can come up with, 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 an, uh, with a solution like that, we'll be good, we'll be in good hands. Um, and, of course, you read, I'm sure, if you've been following the subject at all, that uh, the defense appropriations bill last year included five words uh, that, it, that said contractors now fall under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the UCMJ. Well, some legal experts would say that they always fell under the black, the black letter of the law said that they always fell under the UCMJ. But the problem is the Pentagon has not yet issued implementing instructions. And without implementing instructions, um, nothing really gets done, and not just at the Pentagon, but and it at any, um, in any federal agency. And then further, Secretary Gates and Secretary Rice uh, have come to an agreement and signed it that talked about what the next steps are to ensure that private security contractors are held accountable, what processes, processes will they go through, training requirements, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that came out maybe two or three weeks ago. So again, uh, it's moving forward, uh, uh, but people are still trying to unpack all of this and figure out what really needs to be done. Uh, we'll skip those. Okay, so what are the considerations today? What, what do we really have to look at? One is U.S. policymaker and decision maker um, knowledge and education about what's really going on. We have 535 members of Congress. Um, they each have a, a specific staff. Unfortunately, the work for them is about 56 times more than the staffs that they have. Um, Congress is overworked, um, although they should probably come to work uh, a few more days a year, but but, but they, they've got a lot of information that they have to sort through. They've got a lot of information that they have to sort through. And, uh, and it's tough. It's tough. Everything, everything is important, right? Uh, everything is important. Um, so being able to educate them on what really uh, uh, the issues are and, and, and what the holes are, and, and including the private sector in that conversation, can help. Um, there's, a, there's a race for regulation. Everybody, everybody's trying to propose legislation on the floor of their respective... Uh, 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 chambers, and uh, what's going to happen is we're going to have a bunch of legislation that some of it's overlapping. It's going to leave other gaps because not a whole bunch of people are working together. So hopefully we'll see how that works out, but there's a race for it. Um, we talked about contract management, right? The government um, uh, really needs more contract experts. They really do, um, and they've admitted as much in, in the recent reports. Media sensationalism and industry uh, misperceptions. Okay, so this is going to be a bit subjective, right? And I'm sure that I'm going to come across a little biased. But not everything you read is true about my former company, about other companies. It's just not true. The problem is we're not having an open and frank discussion about it. Nobody's asking any real questions. We're picking up the paper. We're reading blogs, and we're saying, those greedy, corporate, mercenary, bad people... 
all of their money. They're making all this money. They're making 50 times more than a soldier. They're, they're, I, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And when you start unpacking that and sort of figuring out what the real truth is, people start to say, huh, really? I didn't know that. Now, the idea is how do you virally spread that conversation so that everybody gets it uh, a little bit better and we, and we can have the broader conversation. Rice bowl issues. We talked about a primacy of mission. Um, what, do it, what do inherently governmental and core uh, uh, function actually mean? We have a tough thing, right? We have an OMB circular, A76, that talks about uh, um, um, competition between the private sector and government and the government for services that, can be, that, that should be rendered to the government. Now, it does say that defense services... I'm sorry, it says, uh, well, what's the right terminology? Basically, it says that th those sorts of services should not be outsourced. Um, but then you're, you're posed with a much greater political question. You're posed with a September 11th. Now what? You know, now what do we do? And, and that's one of the issues that, that they've had. Um, the morality and the ethics uh, involved in the use of force, not just in the, in the use ad bellum sense, the decision to go to war, uh, but the use in bellow sense, and that is the conduct of the war, which, which has been the main focus um, uh, 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 on private security contractors particularly is rules of engagement. What are they really allowed to do? What can't they do? Who's accountable? When do we make decisions? And when you couple that with our new counterinsurgency strategy, which makes the civilian the center of gravity for operations, which automatically puts the soldier, sailor, airman, marine uh, in a position where they have to assume more risk themselves in order. Um, now what do you do when you have contractually, there's a list of things in my contract that says I have to do A, B, and C, but A, B, and C don't necessarily match up with a change in strategy for everyone else. And that's a problem, and, and uh, we need to find a better way to kind of have that conversation about how we manage those contracts so that, so that the actions um, of, of a private security company, of a private military company, um, which they're executing faithfully per the contract, are not counter to what everybody else is doing. And, and, and it's a big deal, and, and we need to have a, a long talk about that. Um, bad actors and degradation of, of, of government uh, capability over time. If we just outsourced everything, who would know, who over time, who in the government would have any expertise to carry on should everybody throw up their hands and say, I don't feel like doing this anymore? Um, it's a fair question. I don't think it's anywhere near to that extreme, but it's a fair question. What capabilities and competencies should government always have uh, reside in itself? And, and what of those capabilities and competencies, what pieces of those could, could be outsourced, could be contracted out? And it's a, again, it's a broad discussion that we just haven't had yet. You, we sort of skipped over all the big discussions and went right to the action. Okay, so what are, what's possible in the future? We have what's called in the military, uh, in the Defense Department, foreign internal defense. Um, this is where special operations guys particularly, but other, other military units go to partner nations and they train them. They, they try to increase their capability so that they are a better force, a better ally, and better able to contribute um, in, in different international uh, contingency operations. Well, when you deploy everyone, that, that, that partner nation capacity development uh, stops, right? But we do have the ability to re-leverage a whole bunch of, of fantastic retired men and women who've had a, a whole career already uh, uh, doing these sorts of things um, for, this sorts of th for this sort of training. Um, you have to decide what it's going to be because, of course, the Defense Trade Control, Acts, Control Act precludes certain uh, what's called tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, from being uh, released from non-DOD entities, so everybody's trying to work through that. But it's a, it, it's a, it is a conceptually a big deal um, to continue to build our partner nation capacity. Surge capacity for the U.S. government, and what does that mean? That means whenever we find ourselves in a position where it didn't work out the way we planned, where it didn't work out the way we had hoped, um, and we don't have the resources on station, can the private sector help provide surge capacity to meet that gap until you can fill it yourself? And the answer is yes. The more important question is, is there interest in filling the gap yourself after you've received surge 
service. And that's also another public policy question that should be discussed. Um, stabilization and reconstruction operations, provincial reconstruction teams, things of that nature. Great, great opportunities for the private sector to contribute. I don't mean take over. I don't mean run. I mean provide capacity to, contribute to. Still under government mandate, still under international organization mandate, uh, uh, not, not just perfectly privatized. That's not what I'm referring to. Um, providing long-term supporting uh, uh, services for humanitarian relief operations. January 1st, the joint African Union-UN uh, peacekeeping force took over in Darfur. The mandate, which took about 18 months to execute, calls for 26,000 peacekeepers. There's 9,000 on the ground. Essentially, no new people showed up. We just, they're all wearing a different helmet now. Um, the challenge before this change was that uh, peacekeepers, uh, the AU peacekeepers, we're only doing about 20% of the missions that they were supposed to do uh, because they didn't have all the resources that they needed. So we still had incursions into IDP camp, uh, internationally displaced uh, persons camps. We still had Janjaweed attacks. We still have killings today because there's not enough resources. Sudan, uh, Darfur is about the size of France, and we've got 9,000 people there. Um, and so. I'm not really a UN basher. I'm not. Um, I'm a member nation basher. You're telling me that 192 members of the United Nations, we can't get 26,000 people together to stop a genocide? And then you wonder, when we can't do that, why the private sector, why people who are, are good citizens, good global citizens, stand up and say, okay, I'll go? Think about that. There are people being hacked to death, murdered, people without the hope of hope. And we're all standing around watching it, as George Clooney said on TV the other night, in slow motion. Four years worth of slow motion. So what is it that we have to do? Here's the other thing. If 26,000 people arrived in Darfur tomorrow, we don't have enough helicopters and trucks to get them anywhere. Because the member nations, if you read the paper today, Ban Ki uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is begging people, begging member nations for support. But we don't have enough helicopters and trucks to get anybody anywhere. It's 2008, ladies and gentlemen. And it's still okay for people to get hacked to death on this planet. That's why people from the private sector stand up and say, right, I'll go, whatever. And even if the private sector's push to go drives the 192 member nations to do what they've said they would do under the charter, what they've said they do under the responsibility to protect documents, fine, at least we stop the killing. But my goodness, I mean... Do we, do we need to see one more picture? Do we need to see Srebrenica again? Rwanda? Do we need to see all these things again? What, like, what do we need? What sort of wake-up call do we need as, as, a, as, a, as a planet? I'm not sure. Um, the UN is trying to put together what's called um, the United Nations Emergency Peace Service, and that would be a standalone, um, sort of on-call, uh, immediate intervention force. Uh, I think the number is for 25,000. Um, but I'm not sure. Uh, right now, it's, it's just sort of a, a, a pipe dream, a little bit of a pipe dream. It's not, it, we can't get enough people to go now. How are we going to get a 25,000-person standing army? Um, and then, of course, uh, port security, uh, shipping security, border security. Huge, huge issue here domestically. And, um, and uh, okay, either we're going to put more border agents in place or we're going to have a virtual border that has a better persistent surveillance so we can better allocate resources, or we're going to build a, like a 3,000-mile fence. Um, I've got to tell you, I'm not in favor of the fence necessarily. I think that's a lot of work um, for people to find a different way to get into the country. I think what we need is, is, a, is a, a much broader strategy that, that doesn't have people illegally coming into the country, that doesn't have people needing to come in. You, you can, it's such a conundrum because we have a Statue of Liberty that says, give me, you're tired, you're hungry, you're poor. And at the same time, we're saying, but I got a pretty big fence in the backyard. So we have to sort of figure that out. Uh, and I know that it's an important issue here in Florida as well. Okay, just uh, we talked about humanitarian uh, support. I, I just wanted to uh, briefly talk to you Two seconds about here's the problem what we forced the world to do because Western nations have not been involved in peacekeeping operations is we forced third world countries to say I'll go 
and they take UN uh, peacekeeping money, and they might put some of it toward their peacekeeping training, but the majority of the people who show up are ill-trained and ill-equipped to perform peacekeeping missions. So 17,000 of them show up somewhere, and we have the same situation 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 months later. It's just a, a, this persistent problem that goes on and on um, because the West has, by and large, stayed out of peacekeeping. Um, and so it's become sort of a, an alternative revenue stream for many third world nations to continue to get money, but to divert that money elsewhere to more pressing needs rather than developing a peacekeeping uh, Okay, so what to read and watch and do. We're, we're, we're done. A couple slides, sorry. A uh, couple slides. Um, Peter Singer wrote pretty much the, the most recent, uh, uh, wrote the seminal work on, on the recent activity of private military companies called Corporate Warriors. She's at the Brookings Institution right now. Uh, Deborah Avant wrote Market for Force, which is probably the seminal academic work, um, and, and, and it's, it's good. Uh, Mercenaries to Market just came out, uh, Outsourcing Sovereignty. Um, and, and, and the rest of these things. Uh, anything by me. Is, as a matter of fact, we got a table out back, nine ninety nine. You can get the whole package. <laughs> Not really. Um, and then here's some here's some of the uh, the documentaries and shows that have been put on uh, by PBS, the History Channel. And let me tell you, not all the. Um, I can assure you that the Frontline series is not supportive of the industry. Um, I can assure you that uh, uh, Our Children's Children's War by Ted Koppel, which I participated in, uh, he has questions. So I'm not just giving you stuff that supports what you think my position is. This is real, these are really uh, good critical pieces that if you're interested. But the thing that I really want to remind people of is this. Can you tell the difference here between who's in the military and who's, in, who's, a, who's a, a private security guard? Sure you can, right? Camis on the right, the utilities on the right, and, and, the, and the khaki uniforms on the left that say big security on the back. So you can tell the difference in that picture. Can you tell the difference now? Here's the point. No matter what you think, at the end of the day, we still have brave men and women who feel like they're supporting their country and who volunteer to go into harm's way. Are they making money? Yes, they are, but they only work when there's work. There's no care follow-on benefits. They don't get to go, uh, they, don't, they don't have follow-on health insurance. They don't have all of those things. They're independent contractors. But yet they still go. I can tell you I've spoken to thousands upon thousands of contractors. Yeah, there's people who want to go over and make money. There's no doubt. There's people, but none of them that I have spoken to are perfectly devoid of, any, uh, of altruism. They really believe that they're doing they're doing good, that they're continuing to do good in the world. And we should remember that. Um, we should remember that they've elected to go into harm's way. Whether you agree or disagree with government policies, that's a different question. Uh, what I can tell you is, or what I can recommend is, next time you go to the voting booth and you're not happy, pull a different lever. Because that's what democracies do. Thanks for your time this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, how are you? Mr. Taylor. Yes, ma'am. I have no doubt about your goodness and decency and that you believe in everything you say here. As a former professor, someone who dealt with philosophy and morality, and you yourself mentioned that these are the underlying issues that we haven't addressed here, so that many of your points stand alone without that philosophical undergirding which they require, OK? Mm -hmm. And in the United States, we have civilians in charge of our military and in charge of the defense. And I realize that oversight has been loose of late. But I am frankly very uncomfortable, despite the motivations of you and many of the people in the executive and the mercenaries, you yourself use that term, that your former company employed, to carry out the functions which I feel uh, accrue to
to our United States government. You mentioned before the uncertainty regarding uh, co our Congress persons, that they're not sure and you can fill them in. You mentioned that there was no definition for a private military contractor. Wow, that's pretty pretty serious so omission not to have that, huh? And uh, yes. you know the ad advice and consent that you 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 afford Congress. Um, I think that without these issues being addressed, I'm not convinced. I know, you know, when, when I think of Rwanda and Darfur, there there could be a role for paramilitary forces there, but you don't get to do that. Your company doesn't get to do that in this country, and I'm I without that, I am very very fearful. And I don't know that there's anything you said here tonight that convinces me until those bottom line issues are addressed. And I understand that that's just not the fault of Blackwater or the other companies, but of perhaps our own government. Right. Uh, I, thank you. I, let me say, you make a, a fantastic point. Um, and I've written a couple of op-eds in which I've said that uh, our greatest challenge is that we haven't had the discussion yet about what the role of America is in the world, um, what our national values are, um, and certainly uh, with the philosophy and morality of the ethics of the use of force, uh, just and unjust, or just war theory, uh, and what have you, I perfectly agree with you. I, I absolutely agree with you. That conversation needs to be had, and you're right, it's wrong that it has not been had. And when it has been had, it's been encased in striking a pose and gotcha politics that gets none of us anywhere. So what I would recommend is that I would, if I can make a suggestion, is if you feel this strongly, and I, I believe that you do, I, I don't know who the congressman is here or who the, sen who the senators are here, but you know what? Get them on, call them, write them, get them on board. Start the discussion, because I'll go back to what I said. That's what democracies do. If you're unhappy with the way the government's being run, then you have a, f a voice to do it. I would point out, though, you have a free voice that so many other people in the world don't have. And that is one of the motivations for, for what I do. So thank you for your comment. I absolutely agree with you, ma'am. Sure, absolutely, sir. I'm Harold Loesch. I'm retired from the United Nations. Um, I have a couple of double barrel question about Blackwater. Blackwater was a rather small outfit not too many years ago, and now it's a multi-billion dollar outfit. And they have the reputation of shooting first and asking questions later. The worst thing I've heard of them was uh, after a New Year's party, some, some Blackwater person was returning from a party and shot and killed a guard for a vice president. Uh, the Iraq threatened to try him, and Blackwater got him out of the country before. Uh, why can Blackwater get by with things like that? Second, uh, Blackwater seems, and people like that seems to be fighting the war instead of the soldiers now. Uh, well, thanks for your question. Let me. I, I, I should point out first. I, I don't. I don't work for Blackwater anymore, and I don't speak for Blackwater anymore, okay? And that's important for us to remember. Um, here's here's the, the, the crux of everything. Um, it goes back to, uh, first of all, nobody, is, nobody should be, nobody should be um, free of the judicial system to be held accountable for committing a crime. No one. No one. Um, but I have to go back to... to to the, the, the challenge that is we don't have the government. It's, a private company can't, can't enforce the law on, on criminal activity. It has to be the government. That's, that is the government's role. Um, we need better investigation and, and uh, uh, um, enforcement in country so that when, when things do happen, at the very least, they can be investigated. At the very least, you can decide whether or not we should pursue this or not. And that's just not happened. And, and I can tell you that we work on it constantly. I, am, I, I have this conversation all the time about what's missing. And that's why I referenced um, the Princeton group at the uh, Law and uh, Public Affairs uh, um, uh, Research Center up there, which is, is precisely the problem that we're trying to, uh, to fill in. So I, I can't answer your specific question with regard to, to that. Um, there aren't private security contractors. There, there is no war fighting going on by private security contractors. There just isn't. I know it's popular. I know we read it in the paper all the time, and it, and it makes stories a little more spicy and sexy, but that's not what's happening. The mandate is defensive. 
They don't go out and plan missions. They don't go out and attack people. They do not war fight. The fairer question is, and, and I believe it's a fair public policy question is, if there is this much violence going on, should we have the private sector involved? Or should, should, the, should the military have already assuaged much of, of the violence before we bring, and that's, that's a fairer question. But there is no war fighting going on by the private sector. They, they are, I, I promise you, they're not fighting. They're not war fighting. They just aren't, there is no offensive activity going on. They're just not doing it. Thank you, Thank you sir, for the question. Last March, I gave a presentation at the Intelligence Summit in St. Petersburg, Florida, and probably one of the major scandals in government contracting in Iraq. It had to deal with the multi-billion dollar contracts let by the Army Intelligence and Security Command for translators. You may be familiar with some of that. Names like Titan, DynCorp, and Khaki. When you talk about the ability of our government to screen who are translators either in the field or for these contractors. Many of the translators in the field, earnest and honest, who have been cleared, have been killed. Others are, in fact, the perpetrators of their killing. We have effectively been infiltrated through these government contractors by al-Qaeda terrorists in the field, I can point to a recent prosecution here in the United States of two women, one of them a former Marine Corps captain who served as a translator and intelligence expert in the field in Iraq. I can also point to another who was part of a cell for Hezbollah who did that. The problem is that we also have a revolving door in Washington. The best example of that is the former commandant of the Army Language School who joins a company in Washington in the Beltway and is awarded a $3.5 billion contract to replace Titan. Meanwhile, our troops in the field are not secure. The intelligence that they should be getting as a result of this work is not finding the right levels, and basically the system is broken. Uh, um, I, 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 clap if you want. If somebody wanted to clap, that's fine. That's good. No, I, seriously, I mean, I, you should, if, if people agree with the comment, can I, give me a second to address. Um, you're right. I want to go back to what I've said before again and again. The private sector responds to the, the demands of the government. It is a public policy decision. If, it, if, if, if we shouldn't be using interrogators and translators from the private sector, if that's a public policy decision that's made um, after all of the discussion and debate and dialogue that needs to occur, then we don't do it. I mean, the problem is, and I want to keep driving this home, there has not been an open and frank discussion about what's really going on. The more you play gotcha and strike a pose, not, not you, people in Washington, but the more we play gotcha and strike a pose, the less real information that we have. Bad people should, do, should, should be held accountable. There's just no, no doubt about it. And, and, uh, and uh, I think the intelligence community has a little different um, challenge uh, itself. So uh, hopefully they're all working on that as well. Uh, first of all, Mr. Taylor, I just want to thank you for coming to talk to us. Uh, I want to mention two things you said. First, the huge downsizing of military forces, especially after the Cold War. And second, the role of private security companies to fill this gap. Um, do you think this trend is something that's here to stay? Or in, in your opinion, has there been any movement among decision makers to reverse this trend, to create uh, larger government forces or new government forces within the United States to fill this gap in the meantime? Uh, good question. Sure. There's, a whole, there's all kinds of, of kind of debate going on on, on, uh, on what we should do. I think, um, I believe Congress recently approved an additional 28, 29,000 Marines and a, a large number, 70,000 soldiers. I believe that they've already done that. Um, but I want to I want to impress upon you and others that it's not just about adding more troops. It's about who are we going to be in the world. What is our what should our role be? Is our role to export a baseball cap to everyone in the world? Is our role to promote civil society throughout the world? Is our role regime change? Um, 
we have to have that, we have to figure that out. And unfortunately, it's a presidential election year right now. So everybody's hunkered down. Nobody's really saying a whole bunch. And when they do say something, it's very sharp and very spicy and sexy. But there's no, there's no information behind it yet. And I, I, I just don't think we're going to get the discussion that we need to have till after there's a new administration. No matter who wins, there's, that conversation will happen. But it's not going to happen till after. So I don't know if we're going to reverse the trend. But I can, I can assure you, because uh, Senators uh, Jim Webb and Claire McCaskill passed the uh, uh, War Contracting Commission uh, recently, and that's a two-year commission. And I'm, Senator Webb is, is, is a good man and has served this country for, for a long time. And uh, I, I can't imagine that he and, his, and, and Senator McCaskill and, and the rest of the commission aren't going to look at every single aspect of, uh, of, of contingency contracting in the United States. I'm, I'm, I would imagine there's going to be an awful lot of people ask, asking and answering an awful lot of questions. In the back. We get a couple of folks in the back who are raising their hand. Uh, I, I'm wondering um, about the various jobs that uh, we ask these uh, people to do. It seems a lot of them should be done by our military. An example is the, uh, the Marines are responsible for protecting our embassies, and yet when uh, and yet we're using uh, con contractors to to transport the the people around. Uh, should the Marines be doing this work? Um, um, one, you're true that the Marines do protect the embassies, but the Marine Corps mandate for embassies around the world is for the chance rebuilding. Um, it is not for diplomatic security support. We have what's called diplomatic security service at the Department of State. The diplomatic uh, uh, security service agents are the ones who actually provide the close protection for ambassadors and other visiting dignitaries. It's not the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps' responsibility is for the chance rebuildings at embassies particularly. So traditionally, it hasn't been a role that the Marine Corps or, or other military forces have actually been performing. It has been a role for the diplomatic uh, security service. I'm sorry, sir? It might have been a natural um, I, would, I would probably say the Marine Corps, one, the, small, one of our, the, the smallest force would, would tell you. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine up at Harvard is a, a battalion commander, who, Silver Star winner, and, and two Purple Hearts, who said, positively, absolutely, I do not want my Marines doing that sort of work. They're war fighters. I want them fighting a war. They shouldn't be escorting people around. And that's one opinion. I mean, th th certainly. But again, um, that's traditionally not the role that they have fulfilled. Sir? Yeah. Uh, you've been talking international mostly. <clears throat> and I'd like to bring this home in a, in a way I'm very much concerned about how you would go about uh, encouraging collaboration between private industry businesses and the government. And uh, my reason for that is we're, we all know about hurricanes and possibility of terrorism, but we haven't really addressed some of those issues of how to get the uh, collaboration that we need between the government and private industry? Um, it's, it's a great question. Um, you, you know, I, it's, it's a broad one, so let me try and f narrow in a little bit. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, there was quite a bit of private sector participation. As a matter of fact, I was sitting in a classroom with, with Sharon at Harvard the day that uh, Katrina hit, and that was, I think, our last day of class before we left. Um, and the private sector played a, a pretty significant role down in, down in Katrina. Um, the, 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 the question, I mean, the problem is enormous. Well, it's, it's easy to blame the president. It's easy to blame FEMA. You can work your way down to the governors. You can work your way down to the mayors. You can work your way down to... We're, I, in my opinion, um, uh, we still may be, while there's lots of things that we can correct right away, we still, be made, still may be too close to kind of see really, really what happened and why there was such a failure. Three of our classmates were adjutants general of surrounding states of Louisiana. And three of them had not yet received phone calls when the hurricane hit to pre-stage their troops um, for assistance. I was, I, I, I was shocked. Um, and again, I'll go back to the private sector responds to government needs. If the, if, if the government has to, generally the conversation starts with the government saying, What's your good, what goods do you have? What wares do you have? Show, show me what you got. And there's a big industry day, and we all talk about how great we are and how we can save um, uh, babies and, and build schools and hospitals. And we, you know, everybody. But at the end of the day, um, 
you really, it's the government's responsibility, first and foremost, for the taxpayer to understand the services that it needs and what it needs to go buy. Um, and, and business needs to be a much better vendor than they, it also needs to be good vendors as well to make that business government relationship work properly. Um, at the end of the day, I'll go back to its, its citizen participation. It's, it's, it's the fact that citizens um, look into their own backyards and see what's going on and what's needed that really drives our representatives to do what they're supposed to do or what you demand that they do. This is, they, they're, they're there for you. You're not there for them, right? So that's... We have a lot of time for one more question. Sir. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. We, can we make it two? Is that all right? Can we make it two? Because I, I didn't see this hand over here. I'm sorry. Right. Sorry, Ken. I apologize. I'm, I just wanted to tell you, Chris, that I appreciate this last slide that you say you can't tell the difference. I just married two weeks ago a man who retired from the Army for 26 years and is now working for Dynacor as a head military pilot, uh, helicopter pilot in Afghanistan. And I especially appreciate this last slide that it's just as noble what he's doing now than what he did for the Army. Yes, thank you. It is. Lots of noble people doing some good work. Thank you. <laughs> Miss Gentleman, I think. You've, descri you've described uh, the high qualifications for what we've facetiously called mercenaries. I've read in the papers that the standards for getting into the military fighting a, a war, uh, standards have gone down. My question is, wouldn't it be better to have the so-called mercenaries fight the real war? Because they're better qualified. <laughs> and here I thought I was going to be one stirring the pot tonight. Um, Absolutely, positively, no. And here's why. Yeah, surprising, huh? Here's why. We have the finest fighting force that's ever been known on this planet. And the reason we have a f the finest fighting force is because we've put effort into it and because it's an all-volunteer force. And we can do more with people who are committed. You know the story. I'd rather go to war with a, uh, one lion than 30 sheep. And we've got a bunch of lions running around in uniform for the United States of America. The other thing is, is that it's interesting, if you take a public economics class and they ask you for the definition of a public good, the quintessential example, national defense. National defense. It's a warm blanket that you as a citizen that we all need to know that regardless of what happens, there are brave men and women in uniform who will respond. So should we be having companies like my former company and other companies fighting wars? Positively not, and we should do everything in our power to ensure that they cannot offensively fight these wars. What does it say about our government if they abdicate their responsibility to protect their citizens? No. No can do. <laughs> than that of which you might be reading in the media, um, seeing different movies, documentaries, or perhaps if you do, like Carl said, Google Chris Taylor and Blackwater and you might read a bunch of things that may not be completely accurate. So I hope to... I hope, I hope that we kind of sift through some of that tonight. So I, generally when I, when I do talks like this, it's a very international presentation. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Americanize it a lot this evening. Um, because if we were going to talk about the history of mercenaries, we would start back with Xerxes and Ramses um, in the BC era and just and move our way through history. And I'm, I'm not sure anybody wants a, a history lesson this evening. But I am going to give you a little bit, hopefully, uh, American history lesson um, and just talk about the contribution uh, from the American perspective of the private sector. But how did we get to where we are currently today? Uh, it's, no, it's no secret that you can open up a newspaper, uh, read a blog, and you're going to read about a private contractor somewhere, Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, uh, and any number of other places. Well, here's, here's, here's a couple facts that we need to know. Um, over the last 20 some years, we've had a global drawdown of about six million soldiers, from militaries from all over the world. These are people who have been professionally trained, um, who serve their countries, and who are out of work. Um, and so uh, they're looking for things to do. And uh, entrepreneurial and innovative people started to form uh, companies to help support different efforts, not all of them good efforts. Um, 
And of course, we always hear about the, revolutionary, uh, the revolution in military affairs. This is sort of an iterative process. It didn't start with Secretary Rumsfeld, although Secretary Rumsfeld was pushing hard for it. Um, it's been going on since 1775. Every time we find a different way to fight a war, we call it a revolution in military affairs um, with, with the requisite changes in force structure, weaponry, and there you have it. And then September 11th happened. Um, and as I was reminded today by uh, uh, one of the wonderful scientists here at IHMC, um, our cognitive understanding, um, uh, our conceptual understanding of the word terrorism for Americans changed on September 11th. The definition you had September 10th is different from the definition that you understand it to be today. And I think that's very, very, very important when we start to talk about the meta questions um, about what should America's role be in the world? What are our national values? And how do we take those and formulate good national security and foreign policy? And, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, going forward. And then of course, we just have a different um, uh, set of circumstances, a different way of waging war today. Uh, third generation warfare, which is brigades uh, rushing to, moving to maneuver, firing, maneuvering to the target, um, uh, uh, they work, I mean, that works. Um, it's, it's everything that happens afterwards and in between that matters. What's referred to fourth generation warfare, um, where your enemy uses the internet better than you do, where they learn faster than you can adapt, where they spend money in, in places that you didn't think of first. And it's those sorts of things that creates the gaps that sometimes the private sector is perfectly positioned to fill. Okay, I, I imagine that there's going to be some questions uh, later on. So if you don't mind, sometimes I'm going to go through some slides that I don't think are uh, absolutely necessary and we'll drive on so that I can leave enough time for questions. Um, it's interesting, I went to school, as Sharon mentioned, I should mention Sharon was my classmate at Harvard in 2005 at the uh, Program for Senior Executives in National and International Security. That's where we met. So she's a, a well-trained national security expert as well here at IHMC. Um, one of my professors at Harvard the other day said, you need to remember that big business was in the United States before big government was. Why? Because when we settled, these were chartered companies that came over. We had to raise our own private security armies. We had to, we had to provide for ourselves all across um, these first settlements and, and as the colonies were created. And I, I don't mean to say that that's, it should always be that way. I'm saying that that's how it started. Um, contractors, the Plymouth Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company, the Virginia Company, all of these were chartered companies by uh, the British Crown to get things started here in the, in the United States and uniquely it's the uh, 400th anniversary of the, of, of, of the uh, settling uh, in uh, Jamestown this year. They put on a great celebration. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, this is a Civil War uh, uh, um, example here where we're President uh, Lincoln used uh, Alan Pinkerton as basically his intelligence service. We didn't have a strong intelligence service when the Union was fighting the South. Um, and, and so he went out to private... been to Pensacola since about 1994 and I'm happy to come back. I came back last night and Sharon was kind enough um, to take me out to the fish house where I had uh, grits and yaya and I thought it was fantastic. So I'm, I'm happy to be down here uh, in Pensacola again. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. I saw some just amazing things going on here today. Uh, in support of so many different efforts um, for the government and, and, and other efforts. Um, but uh, for those of you who perhaps just come for the lectures and, and don't know a lot about IHMC, I would encourage you to come get a tour if you can or, or whatever, whatever, whatever process they have because it's, it's just amazing the work that they're doing here. And uh, I'm very happy to be down here. Um, so I woke up this morning and uh, I get little Google alerts on my computer and in my email was uh, an op-ed in your local newspaper this morning. Um, just so we know, the speed of information 
in the world today, that went to about 50,000 people, friends of mine. Uh, in about 23 seconds, I got more phone calls about being down here in Pensacola and speaking here this evening than, uh, 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 so good on you. Is, Mr. is it Mr. Wernicke? Is he in the room today? All right. Carl? Is he <laughs> well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> so tonight, um, I, it's very interesting. I, I, I no longer work at Blackwater. I haven't since May. Uh, when I was accepted to go to school at Harvard, I resigned. Um, so many people always want to ask lots of questions, particularly about Blackwater, particularly about um, perhaps different incidents and things of that nature. Um, and I'm happy to answer some of those questions at the end of the presentation as I can, but keep in mind I can't answer everything. I don't know the answer to everything, but I'll do the best I can. But for this evening, what I want to talk about is, is the broader contribution that the private sector makes um, to national and international security. And hopefully what I'm going to do is perhaps give you a different perspective than that um, that happened between FDR and, uh, and, the UK and, and Winston Churchill, but it also went to China and, and it was kind of backdoored and we had all kinds of stuff going on. But basically, we, we released 100 planes uh, to go over. We recruited active duty pilots and other pilots to serve as pilots we paid them a lot more money. We, we sort of incentivized. There was an incentive program. The more you uh, do better, the, the more you kill, the more bridges you take out, the more trucks you take out, the more aircraft you shoot down, the more I'm going to pay you. And they were overwhelmingly successful um, during World War II. The, the, the Flying Tigers were fantastic. Of course, they turned into, when I was a young Marine, uh, we used to fly to Okinawa on Flying Tigers. I don't know if they just changed because it was a 747 or, or, or what was going on, but, but the, the mission still... Held. So that leads us sort of to today. What do the companies who are participating today actually do? Uh, 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 many of you uh, pick up a paper and you read about companies such as Blackwater, a Triple Canopy, a DynCorp, uh, a SOC SMG. You really, what you read is the private security companies, which are probably about 5% of the entire market, maybe. Maybe 5%. The rest of the companies do logistic support, Medical support, um, waste disposal, very important in Iraq, I have to tell you. Um, transportation support, both aviation and ground. Uh, maintenance support, whether it be on trucks, on vehicle, other vehicles, tanks, uh, um, any other sorts of gear. Th these companies are doing that sort of support. And then at home, we do a lot of planning and games and simulation. Uh, generally, that's conducted in the Beltway or in Virginia. And there's other places all around that do that. But, but there's sorts of places like that that... That, that, help, that help the government test itself and then help it find solutions for, for moving forward. We also have uh, information and intelligence uh, open source gathering and analysis. And that's something very new. I'm sure if you've read the paper any time recently, there's a big deal. The uh, Central Intelligence Agency came out with um, a report on sort of how many contractors they had and that they were going to reduce the number of contractors they were using by 10%. Um, and, and so on. So, so the whole issue of, of, of the private sector being involved in this is, is as you all know, very contentious. Um, and then the last part is, it's the private security companies who protect people, places, and things. Um, and that's really where my expert citizens. Um, and if we back up just a second, uh, anybody here been to the White House, seen the White House, been, been up to Washington, seen the White House? Okay, you've looked across the street into Lafayette Park? Uh, loosely termed, Lafayette was a contractor. As a matter of fact, we jokingly refer to Lafayette Park as Contractor Park um, because the four statues in Lafayette Park are Lafayette, Kosciusko, uh, Rochambeau, and Von Steuben. Thank you um, for the pronunciation. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and so if you think, I think at the time, and, and historians could correct me, before, before uh, Von Steuben and Lafayette retrained or trained the Continental Army, we were about 0-6. Um, and we needed to be a little bit better than that. And with the addition of Rochambeau, uh, uh, his advising uh, Washington, um, and instead of going to Richmond, we went down to Yorktown to fight the battle, which was decisive. Uh, we fared very well. John Paul Jones, who is said to be buried um, underneath the chapel at the Naval Academy. I'm sure that there are Naval Academy graduates in the classroom. It's said that he's buried there. He was a privateer. He, was a, he, he wasn't commissioned. Um, afterwards, people were commissioned, but while the Revolutionary War was going on, we had a bunch of private people fighting for us. And it's just interesting to note that, that that's how we started. Um, 
Sutlers and merchants, I'm sure people have heard, has anybody here ever heard of um, Halliburton, KBR? Uh, No? If if there's anybody who hasn't heard of them. (laughs) Okay, they manage the log cap program, which is the logistics uh, assistance program. Uh, or have, and it's changed now. Uh, it was broken up in four, uh, three or four different pieces, and it's been rebid on and on. But at the time, they did. But the same thing actually happened during the Civil War. We had people um, who would follow uh, with the civilian log trains the soldiers and sell them different, different supplies. Has anybody here uh, been to, uh, served, and has been in Korea um, and trained in Korea anywhere? Um, and so... Uh, when they would come around with moon pies and cokes, that was kind of like a Korean log train to service people who were out in the field. It's sort of the same thing that happened uh, um, in, in Virginia, uh, during the Civil War. It happened a lot. I mean, it, it just it keeps going. And it's very interesting. Um, as a matter of fact, Baron uh, Peter von Vegasek won the Congressional Medal of Honor while serving the Union um, in uh, Gainesville. And then, of course, we've heard of the Flying Tigers before. Actually, kind of a super secret, double secret probation program